title, Preparation for Sonship. <clears throat> Principle. Scripture teaches those who will advance to full sonship will be those who are willing to release their earthly identity for their divine identity. Turn to Galatians, the third chapter, verses 27 to 28. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye all are one in Christ. So it's being said here, when we become regenerate, there's a, a transference, an identity transference from the human to the divine. In this capacity, he's telling us that the human no longer exists. We are to begin to identify with the divine, the cosmic identity. Galatians 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, new creation. <clears throat> the divine Son is what the Father is interested in. Nothing having to do with the former identity. <clears throat> Colossians, the third chapter. Verses 9 to 11. <clears throat> Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. For there is neither Greek nor Jew circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, Christ is all and in all. Again, this principle is repeated at least three times. There is a transition, an identity transition. <clears throat> and there are experiences that await us to affect this transition. Those who are willing to yield to the transition experience of preparing themselves for sonship, full sonship. Those who will advance to full sonship will be willing to lose earthly attachments. We lose our identity, we lose our earthly attachments. Matthew, eighth chapter verses 19 to 22. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus saith unto him, the, son, the foxes have holes, <coughs> and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So what Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, <coughs> you're not going to have any set place to stay. You're going to go where the Spirit leads you. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. 
Jesus said unto him, <coughs> Follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. When he says bury his father, he's not saying that his father just died. He wants to go and, and inter him. What he's saying is, let me take care of him until he dies. <coughs> Jesus said, if you follow me, you have to cut that tie. <coughs> so we find examples here for the earthly attachments, whether they be to things or people. which hinder the development of the sonship identity. Matthew, 10th chapter, verse 37 to 39. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Now the word find there is uh, literally obtain. That's what he's saying person that's going after his life, the person that obtains his life will lose it. And the one that loses and releases it is going to obtain it. <clears throat> we have a new life in Christ. The old life is cut loose. <clears throat> we are to release it in order to en engage in pursuing the new identity. Luke, 12th chapter, verse 32 to 34. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the essence and the quintessence of what we're being prepared for. Sons of the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that fadeth not, and no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now what he's, he's not saying to sell everything and not have anything. Notice what he says. He says, sell that you have. In other words, don't have anything in your life that's excessive to what you really need. And when you do that, when you release it, that that you voluntarily release is going to build treasure in heaven. It becomes a treasure, an eternal treasure in the heavens because you relinquished it. But the understanding that you are <coughs> releasing the old identity embracing the new identity. The Lord does not want us to have anything in our life that's going to hold us back. <clears throat> we have to be in a mindset where we uh, consider ourselves transition creatures. <clears throat> this refers to relationships, possessions, everything. Those who advance are those who are willing to transition from the earthly to the heavenly identity. 1 John, 3rd chapter, verses 2 to 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we're transitioning into a finished product. But we know that when he shall appear, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. It's the understanding of what's taking place in our life that gives us the desire to yield to the process. It gives us the desire to make it paramount first and foremost over everything else in our transition from mortal to immortal. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter <clears throat> verse 48 to 49 <clears throat> as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. So he makes a distinction. Again, he's talking about the body of Christ. You're going to have Christians that are carnally minded, can't make the transition. They can't release, can't let go. The, earth, the, to the totality of the earthly identity. Then you have others who have very little difficulty making the transition. <clears throat> As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. <clears throat> so ultimately, the progression is going to culminate. <coughs> this will happen in every life that's regenerated. There's going to be a point at which culmination takes place. <coughs> Either in death, or at the change in the rapture. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches the spirit within is programmed to understand its heavenly destiny. First Corinthians, second chapter, verse eleven. For what man knoweth the things of a man, said the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now what we find here, the spirit <coughs> knows the path in which <coughs> the life should take. Because the spirit has been programmed by the Holy Spirit to comprehend, to understand. Now the spirit in every one of us is temporary and deaf everybody loses his spirit <clears throat> rapture everybody loses his spirit the spirit goes back to God that gave him unsaved people lose their spirit as well as saved people the last thing that Jesus did on the cross was to yield his spirit to the Father to thy hands I commend my spirit then he died <clears throat> what does that mean? That means the Spirit is there to give us transition to the completion. At the completion, we get the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You don't need the transition Spirit any longer. Those who have yielded to their Spirit and enable the Spirit, which is cohabiting with the Holy Spirit, to perform its ultimate function, will enter into the fullness of sonship, fullness of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> those that don't well, we'll take a look at that result a little later on 2 Corinthians 5th chapter verses 1 to 5 for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <coughs> Paul is stating an uncontested fact. This is what happens in death. Transition to the heavenly house takes place. 
For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So your spirit knows its destiny. And your spirit, cohabiting with the Holy Spirit, is groaning within you. To be able to ascend to the place for which it was created. If so be clothed, we shall not be found naked. We that are in this tabernacle, physical body, do groan. Being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He's saying that the, <clears throat> the Spirit desires to be incorporated in the conditions for which it was created. The new creation is miserable in this corrupted, <clears throat> limited body. Because it's not created for earth life. It's created for life in eternity. Unrestricted life. <clears throat> Verse 5. Now we, now he that has wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So what he's saying here, the word wrought there, <coughs> is uh, ordained. What he's saying here is this God has ordained us to ultimately reside in the place that he's prepared for us. He's also ordained the Spirit to know its destiny so it can direct the life on the path in which it needs to travel to achieve the maturity to qualify for its destiny. So all this is going on within us. As we yield to the desires of the Holy Spirit, which is <coughs> infilling, inculcating, inculcating our spirit with this revelation knowledge, as we yield to those desires, revelation knowledge manifests in the mind. The mind, the thinking changes. The life changes. It all depends upon the willingness of the individual to yield to the process taking place within. Principle, therefore those who fully yield to the desire of the Spirit are being prepared for life in heaven by the experiences they encounter and overcome. If you are committed, there are no accidents in your life. Everything that happens in your life has a purpose. And that purpose is to give you an opportunity to engage and overcome that obstacle. And as you overcome that obstacle, <coughs> you are more and more changed into the new identity. Second Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 17 to 18. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all, <clears throat> open face, beholding as in a glass, mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Each experience that we encounter and overcome molds us, transforms us that much more into the image of Christ. And we gain <coughs> revelation knowledge. We gain maturity. We gain precision, comprehension. It's not the things we experience, it's how we deal with them that makes the difference. And I'm going to break off here a minute and give you an example of this. Turn to Revelation, third chapter.
<coughs> Revelation, the third chapter, we want to pick it up. Verse 14 and verse 18. This is written to Christians. It illustrates the principle of transformation. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, or would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, he's saying, you disgust me. I vomit you out of my mouth. That's rejection. Why? <coughs> because of their indifference to the transition factor in their lives. He says, I'd rather have you a, not, a non-believer than a lukewarm believer. And he's saying this because it's the most, to the Lord, the most heinous insult that the person could attribute in their life is indifference. Knowing but not caring about the ultimate destiny that God has prepared for us. It's like taking the blood of Jesus Christ and not regarding it whatsoever. The price that was paid to give us the opportunity to transition to glory <clears throat> is known and not uh, reckoned with. Notice what he says, why this is. Verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. In other words, they have reached a point where their needs are all met. There's no experience that they have in their life, no challenge that they have in their life to bring about the transition process. And so they become indifferent. They're, they're fixed on a comfort place in the physical environment. And he goes on to say, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye seraph, that thou mayest see. He's talking about the spiritual condition. He's talking about <clears throat> there's a path they need to try, which would bring them experiences that they would overcome. And those, by overcoming it, they will begin to be clothed again with robes of righteousness. They will begin to progress in <coughs> attaining their divine identity. They will progress onto the point which is gold. Try to define gold. What does that mean? That means that when you overcome the challenges that face you, that is adding, from a spiritual perspective, something more valuable than treasure. You're being molded, conformed to the divine image of Jesus Christ. And that's what he <coughs> counsels every Christian to seek gold tried in the fire. Opportunities to grow. Opportunities to pursue that you might transit from the human to the divine. Now let's go on. <coughs> Scripture teaches the rapture is the final in a series of changes. In other words, every time we overcome something, we're changed that much more to the image of Jesus Christ. We grow that much more at the rapture, it is merely the end of a series of changes in the life. The final change that will initiate the fullness of sonship. 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. Verse 52. <laughs> Just 
Oh, Chris Chris Grant. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised and corruptible, and we shall be changed. It's the final change. Paul refers in this whole chapter about the ultimate change that takes us from human to divine, <coughs> from corrupted to incorrupted. The glorification process is but a change in which all conditions, former conditions, pass away. The change first started in the spiritual, when we were regenerate, it ends at the rapture, where we become complete. Now what we find, those who have not progressed to the completion point by the time of the rapture, have not achieved the experiences that were given to them to complete <clears throat> but qualify by their martyrdom in other words they die at some point in the rapture will occupy lesser positions in eternity and that's why they occupy lesser positions because they haven't completed the path that was ordained for them. Turn to Revelation 7th chapter, verse 14. <clears throat> I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, what's being said here, they made it right. They now qualify to enter into <coughs> glory. But they enter into glory in a lesser position than they would have had they gone in the rapture. <coughs> Those that don't have any experiences those who oh, it's full, that's why okay. <clears throat> those who don't have any experience at all in which they transition won't find themselves qualifying for heaven at all qualify for life on the new earth turn to first corinthians the third chapter <coughs> verses 13 15 Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If you have the fullness of the experiences and you've completed the course, then you're going to be at the highest position. <clears throat> Verse 15, If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So the only thing he has is the faith foundation that got him saved. He has no rewards. He's not qualified for life in heaven, but he's saved. So he will be in a region where those others have no rewards, but they have their saving faith. Turn over to Revelation first chapter. <clears throat> the 
Romans, the 21st chapter, and we pick it up in <clears throat> verses 1 to 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride had gone for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God shall himself shall be with them and be their God. Notice they're called men. <coughs> The race of men will inhabit the earth world. What does that mean? That means that we're being prepared for existence beyond the earth concept. Those that cannot transit beyond the earth concept will remain forever on a paradise earth world because they're saved and because <coughs> they remain limited to an earth-centered concept. Now, Revelation 21, verse 23 to 24. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. The glory of God did lighten it. The Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So the nations of them that are saved can't enter into the city because the city is pluralistic. I mean, they can enter in uh, uh, to a limited degree because they walk up the streets of the tree of life to partake of the leaves. But they can't fully participate, partake of it because it is for those who... Uh, operate in plurality uh, beyond the concept of uh, earth. Earth life centers on linear existence, linear progression. And <clears throat> those who cannot transit beyond that cannot participate in the things of the kingdom of the heavens because the heavens operate in plurality. God is a plurality, and His creation operates in plurality. These operate in a linear context. So the Old Covenant saints and the New Covenant saints who are just saved will occupy the new earth. Those others who have qualified will go on to various stages of plurality of existence until you reach the top stage where they are not even in the creation, they are beyond the creation, with dwelling in the presence of the Father. Uh, yeah, but the light's not on. Title, Unseen Detractors. Principle, Scripture teaches Fallen intelligences survey the lives of the saints, seeking opportunities to afflict and to restrict their spiritual progress. Last week we were talking about preparing to be a son of God. This week we're talking about things that detract from the preparation. The main detraction are these unseen detractors. Turn to 1 Peter, 5th chapter, verses 8 to 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, <coughs> whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So what he's saying here <coughs> is that everybody that's on the path to sonship is going to undergo basically the same trials. The enemy doesn't change his method of operation. 
<coughs> he looks for a target of opportunity. And then when he finds his target of opportunity, he um, <coughs> goes about a methodology in bringing about his purpose, which we're going to take a look at <coughs> momentarily. Principle, Scripture teaches the fallen and unfallen intelligences weld weapons which affect in the, spirit, in the physical realm. They're launched in the spiritual realm. They affect the life in the physical realm. Turn to Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, verses 1 to 2. You come under attack. The, uh, the intelligences are bringing a weapon to bear against you. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 2. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So we find both fallen and unfallen intelligences weld weapons. They bring them to bear against humans. Physical individuals. They also bring them to bear against uh, other beings in the spiritual realm also. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches the saint who is vigilant is to do battle. <coughs> to engage the attacking unseen intelligence. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, <clears throat> but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are expected to engage vigorously when uh, we're attacked. But we have to be prepared. If we're not prepared, then we go down. We lose the battle. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the saint who engages in spiritual warfare is promised the victory over the weapons of the unseen intelligence. So we're told that if we are vigilant, we will be given understanding how to deal with the attack of the enemy so that we can gain the victory and win the battle. <coughs> Ephesians, the sixth chapter, notice what it says in verse 16. Above all, so he's saying, he's starting off, this is the most important thing. Taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now the word dart there is literally missile. So we're talking about the weapons that come against us. <coughs> the Holy Spirit will quicken us as to how to deal with the attack. And what the scripture here is promising us that if we do it correctly, we will not be in any way affected by <clears throat> the onslaught of the enemy. <clears throat> You'll be able to parry every blow. You'll be able to shield yourself from whatever the weapon is that's 
basically being brought to bear against you. Turn to Isaiah, the 54th chapter, verse 17. Verse 54, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. What's being said here in the spiritual realm, when a slaughter weapon or a destroying weapon is formed and launched against you, it will not be effective as long as you stand in the weaponry that you possess. The scripture goes on consistently to say you cannot engage in a physical confrontation. It has to be on the spiritual plane. Because we also have weapons that we can bring to bear. They're all spiritual. None of them are physical. And in engaging <coughs> in this hand-to-hand -hand combat, we become overcomers over all the onslaught of the enemy. And, the scripture goes on to tell us, <coughs> it says, every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. So the enemy, it's not only just talking about the physical, it's talking about the spiritual. The enemy that has plotted, planned, <coughs> and designed weapons against you, and spoken against you, one day you're going to condemn that intelligence. Turn over to Revelation, third chapter. <coughs> Revelation 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do I, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, and in you will condemn them. <coughs> the principle. Scripture teaches Satan... When he sees a target of opportunity, he directs rogue spirits into the life, whether it be a person or a society. <clears throat> Revelation 16, verses 13 to 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the battle of Armageddon <coughs> was going to draw the armies of the earth into Megiddo are demon spirits manufactured by Satan, <coughs> the beast, false prophet. This is the same principle that's used in whether it's an individual or if it's a society. <coughs> Satan will see an opportunity and he'll assign a renegade spirit into that life to influence it and ultimately to try to control it. And if it's society, he does the same thing. 